My Bright Abyss by Christian Wyman is a book I've been meaning to read for a long time. It touches on many of the things that I'm really interested in. It touches on uh, religion and it touches on poetry and it also has elements of memoir. Um, and I've been sort of pushing it off for a while because I'm a very uh, critical reader, I, I would say, when it comes to uh, ideas about religion and philosophy and, and I was worried because I had very high expectations for the book and I was worried I would be disappointed but on the encouragement of Jason over at Old Blues Chapter and Verse uh, I realized that uh, maybe Midrash uh, would be a perfect opportunity to to finally read this book and I was not disappointed um, I did not have a physical copy uh, I would have loved a physical copy. I hope to get a physical copy at some point, but I read this one on my phone actually, ebook, and I read it very slowly. And um, it's something that I'm sort of still uh, reeling from. It's it's a very dense book, I would say, and dense in, in the best of ways. A very very rich book. It's it's the kind of book where I feel like I could take uh, any any sort of section of it, any chapter, and um, spend a lot of time with it. If we wanted to, we could sort of divide the contents of the book into three major categories. Uh, one category is that it's very much a personal cancer memoir. It's this, the, it details uh, the excruciating and at times extremely painful uh, experiences of the author, Christian Wyman, as he faces this diagnosis this, of this very rare cancer and he's really looking um, his mortality in the face. Uh, so that's sort of category number one. Um, the second category that a lot of this book falls into is uh, religious reflections. Uh, Christian Wyman turned towards religion recently relative to the writing of the book. Uh, he turned towards religion in the face of his cancer diagnosis. And so sort of grappling with that turn towards religion, trying to put into words what it is that drew him towards religion, what he gets from religion, how he understands and thinks about God, um, is obviously uh, a major, another major part of the book, another major thread in this book. And I think that's probably the most polarizing component of this book. Um, for people who are atheistic, I, it's hard to read uh, a text by a person who's, you know, very much uh, a believer. And that's, that's understandable. Um, but it's also polarizing from the other direction, uh, because the vision of religion that he puts forward is one which is very inclusive and very pluralistic and very open to the many different paths towards spirituality and towards God. Uh, and he writes, he writes really beautifully about that. Yeah, I think a, a lot of this book, for me, felt like a strong argument of anti-fundamentalism. Uh, this Just a really compelling and beautiful vision of what religion could look like in the modern world when it's coupled with a really strong sense of empathy and morality and an understanding of the ways in which different people are different and have different viewpoints and and there's room for that and there's space for that and that's a that's a good thing it's a value one of the parts of the book that in this in this category of uh, subjects that the book touches upon that I really appreciated um, was when he made an analogy he made a, a an analogy that religion is sort of like a language and we use religion to express certain things that are hard to express and to grapple with certain questions that as human beings we're, we're faced with. And he said that different religions are like different languages. And in some ways, you know, most of us can really only hope to be fluent in one language. And for most of us, it's going to be the language of our childhood. And that really spoke to me because I am coming from this book and I was aware of it from the very beginning, from the moment I opened this book. I am coming from this book as an outsider, uh, not being a Christian, being being Jewish, um, and and that really spoke to me because it felt like like yes, like he's articulating and he's speaking in his language, and I speak in, in a different language. But there's a sense in which the 
the underlying insights and the underlying concepts and, and experiences are the same and they and they do overlap um, the third category of this book which is also a major 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 portion of this book an element of this book and and really why I was so attracted to this book in the first place is that it's very much a book about art and about poetry uh, Christian Wyman himself is a poet and he spends a lot of the book um, going through sharing the art and the poetry that is important to him and talking about why it's important to him and specifically he talks about the, the type of art and the kind of art that's important to him as he's facing his own mortality as he's really looking death in the face and I found that super compelling and super it's something that I'm always uh, looking for um, and that's sort of why I even engage in this project of of watching videos and making videos of trying to interrogate the ways in which art and poetry and language can enrich life and enhance life and alter our perspective in meaningful ways. Uh, one last point about the, re the religiosity that's described in the book. There was something I was on the lookout for from the very beginning going into this book, something that I was worried about. And I was raised in, in a tradition and I, and I believe that religious feelings and religious experiences are nice, but there's a sense in which they are like self-indulgent and they are secondary. They're less important than action and morality. And I felt Christian Wyman in this book validated that and he expressed that beautifully and and the language that he used is he gives the story at one point in the book where he's praying in church and again we have this image of a person who's really struggling with a incredibly horrific cancer diagnosis and he's praying in church and he's in this moment of uh, contemplation and he's approached by a homeless man who's we get a sense is probably mentally ill and it sort of shakes uh, the author out of his religious stupor in a way and he has you know he, he has to deal with this uh, person, this human being, the deal of course might have a negative connotation, but I mean uh, respond to this person and he ends up you know, giving him charity. But the point that he makes is that God and religion is not this feel good experience that we just do for ourselves. He says it's like a shard of glass in the gut. It's that what, act, what matters at the end of the day is the actions that it compels us and inspires us to do and I thought that was that was extremely important and if, if it wasn't for that element of this book um, it would have had it would have had much less of an impact and it would have felt much less uh, important to me so there were a million different threads I, I felt I could have sort of seized upon and, and tried to talk about and share in this video uh, and and it was really a, a difficult project of like exclusion of like what what am I not going to talk about because there's so much I I wanted to share but I tried to just narrow it down to a few excerpts that I felt like revolved around sort of a synthesis of of some of these threads to me they, they felt like the most urgent and and beautiful expressions of Christian Wyman struggling with his mortality and struggling with the experience of living in the shadow of death, in the, in the face of death. And so I have on my phone, uh, where, where of course I have, I have the book, just a few quotes, and I just wanted to share them. I don't, I don't know whether or not I'll have anything to say about them. Um, but I feel like this captures kind of the style of the book, and, and for me personally, the real power of the book, and the reason that the book stays with me and I think will stay with me for some time. So in this quote, we're towards the end already, or I guess towards around the middle of the book at this point, he's going to talk about what it's like in, in this condition of, of being near death. And he does it by first comparing it to the opposite condition, which is the condition of uh, not thinking about death at all. And so that's, that's what this quote does. So, quote, when life is thriving in us, we crave to get beyond it. Experience that takes us out of ourselves, 
poetry that articulates a shape and space for the inexpressible, prayer that obliterates self-consciousness for the sake of God. When it is death that is thriving in us, though when the inexpressible has begun to seep into us like some last ineluctable dusk, and the tick of each instant is the click of a door closing us out, we look back. Hospitalized again, breathless because of my useless blood, tethered 24 hours a day to multiple chemotherapies, angered into someone I hardly recognize and do not like. I reach over randomly to the pile of despised books on the bedstand and read, quote, terrifying are the attendant sleek thrushes on the lawn, more coiled steel than living, a poised dark deadly eye, those delicate legs triggered to stirrings beyond sense with a start, a bounce, a stab, overtake the instant and drag out some writhing thing." End quote for the poem. Our author Christian Wyman continues, and weep for the world, this tiny, terrifying, and blessedly untranscendental clarity gives back to me again." End quote. And so there you, you get a sense of the style. It's, it's poetic. I mean, even reading his prose, to me, uh, feels, feels very poetic. And the, the, yeah, that torture that he describes, and then the power of the poem, which is just describing birds on the lawn. It's a poem by Ted Hughes. Um, the poem is called Thrushes, and it just snaps him back to reality and to the, the mystery of reality. And, and he writes in the book that he, he's drawn at this point in his life to art, to poems that are just infused with the real world. You know, they're not like poetry of thought. They're not abstract, but they're just, they draw you to the concrete, to the mystery of existence. And anyway, that, uh, I can't say anything else. Uh, I probably already said too much. Um, Another quote, again, about this experience. <sighs> quote, The terrible thing, it could perhaps be a glorious thing. Always the ill are meant to see it as such, are reproached if they don't. The terrible thing about feeling the inevitability of your own early death is the way it colors every single scene. At some friend's house, I am moved by the beauty and antics of their two-year-old daughter, moved and then saddened to think of the daughter D and I might have, for whom my death will be some deep, lightless hole that for the rest of her life she will walk around. Grief the very ground of her being. What is this world that we are so at odds with, this beauty by which we are so wounded and into which God has so utterly gone?" End quote. Next, next quote. Uh, he, he does end up having uh, daughters, our author. He has two two daughters. Um, I think they're I think they're twins, if I'm not mistaken, but I'm not I'm not sure. Uh, and towards the end, uh, he he addresses them, and this just strikes me as as very uh, beautiful and powerful, and just uh, so I'm going to share it. Again, this is our author addressing his daughters in his in this book. Quote: My loves, I will be with you, even if I am not with you. Every day I feel a little more the impress of eternity, learn a little more the discipline of suffering which leads to peace of the spirit. As T.S. Eliot said, writing of the 17th century poet and priest George Herbert, who died when he was 39 
and had only recently found true happiness with his new wife and new commitment to God. My loves, I love you with all the volatility and expansiveness of spirit that you have taught me to feel. And I feel your futures opening out from you. And in those futures, I know my own. I will be with you. I will comfort you in your despair. And I will share in your joy. They need not be only grief, only pain, these black holes in our lives. If we can learn to live not merely with them, but by means of them, if we can let them be part of the works of sacred art that we in fact are, then these apparent weaknesses can be the very things that strengthen us. Life tears us apart. But through those wounds, if we have tended them, love may enter us. End quote. And, and these black holes, it's, it's an image that he comes back to again and again. In this particular quote, he said that the grief tears a hole in us. It's these black holes that we learn to live with. And that's this theme, this image, this motif of the abyss my bright abyss that, like I said, recurs throughout. And, and he talks about the art of uh, an artist, Lee Bontecue, and he describes going to an exhibit and crying. And uh, of course, I immediately, immediately looked up the artwork and, and he describes the artwork as just these textured sort of abstract forms and these, these vacuous black holes and this sort of interplay. And he's fascinated by that image of the, the abyss, the holes in our lives and in our hearts and, and what we do with them. The last quote on this theme. Quote, Spots of time, Wordsworth called them. Those moments when something in the world, something of the world, even as that something reveals some intuitive and sometimes even intolerable beyond, is made manifest. And not only made manifest, but given agency, animation, attention. Last night, my wife and I finally fell asleep after talking and crying about our life together and the life of our children. The splendor of some moments, so many moments, the gift we have been given, and then the misery of my sickness and the way it is crushing us, the terror that two of us feel at what will happen if I die. I wake in the night with a terror that is pure further than my own. My suffering is the key, but not the content. And for an hour, I am silvered with an icy infinite distance, an abyss of pure meaninglessness of which I am merely some small and dreadfully sentient particle. I am not dreaming. I have never been more fully awake. A spot of time, and what the spot shows, this time, is nothingness, suffering without meaning. End quote. Thanks for watching.